All right, we will go ahead and get started. Um, first, we will have a, our, our land acknowledgement. It is something that we've been doing more of here at the partnership where we just take a quick second to acknowledge the, the people that have come before us and the lands um, that we currently enjoy and the folks that made that possible. So I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so I want to acknowledge the native Creek lands that I live and work on um, and enjoy today. Um, so we have some resources that um, you can use in order to also um, make a land acknowledgement of your own in the chat. I'm just taking a quick second to acknowledge where you are and whose space you're on and you're in. And next slide, please. All right, we will have the promise of community action. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. So we would like for you to sign in and just complete uh, the evaluation links. Uh, we will put the links in the chat for you, just so you can tell us how we're doing, what kind of program you would like to see going forward, um, and just things that you're, you're taking out of the program. Um, so this is the practice transformation team. We are led by Tiffany Marley, who is the senior vice president. Uh, there's Tiffany Day, who is a newcomer to our team. Um, she joins us from the Aspen Institute. Then we have Lily, Lily Seals, who is our director. We have Laura Griffin, uh, who you've just heard from, and Amy Roberge, they are our program associates, and then myself, Gabriel Smith, I'm the senior associate, and uh, we're excited to be here with you and to provide um, some awesome programming that we're going to get today. So our agenda for today, uh, we will have uh, some panel presentations um, focusing on finding families at the highest risk for homelessness, and then we will hear from our panel, and then we will also close out. So, Sharon McDonald is the Senior Fellow for Families and Children at the National Alliance on Homelessness, where she worked for 20 years. Dr. McDonald, excuse me, I'm so sorry, has been a licensed clinical social worker since 1991 and holds a PhD in social work and social policy from Virginia Commonwealth University. So she will um, kick things off for us by introducing the rest of our amazing speakers for today, and we, we're, we're in for a treat, y'all. Um, so, uh, Dr. McDonald, thank you so much. Sorry about that. I had to unmute. This is uh, Sharon McDonald. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Gabriel. I have just a couple of opening comments, if that's okay. Um, our conversation today is really building on the webinar that was held last month, so I encourage you to see that, uh, watch that if you haven't already. In that webinar, we heard from national policy experts, including people from the Secretary's Office at HUD and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, talking about the funding streams that's out there to prevent homelessness. We also heard from really national leaders in homelessness prevention, including Mary Beth Shin and Janie Roundtree with the California Policy Lab. Both have developed tools and are continuing to build uh, our, our collective knowledge on how to get the resources to individuals and families most likely to become homeless and inter shelter. They did have some key lessons for us. One key message uh, is that those at the highest risk of homelessness may not be found by focusing only on those with traditional lease arrangements. So we need to dig a little further. They include families who may be paying weekly to stay in a hotel or doubling up with extended family or um, friends, uh, extended families or friends, and who lack the traditional protections of leases. It may also include people who are um, exiting jail or prison or people who may have just recently exited foster care. 
highly vulnerable people may not actively seek out homelessness prevention assistance. By and large, they haven't been eligible for traditional uh, homeless prevention efforts that's targeted to leaseholders. Um, so we might find some of those folks um, when they're looking for shelter arrangements, um, or we may find them in other ways. So something that uh, Janie Roundtree is working on is questions that might be asked when people apply for welfare benefits. But Mary Beth Shin, the researcher we, who we heard from, is working with um, funders in New York City because having a baby or being pregnant is a risk factor for entering shelter. So identifying WIC offices or prenatal care as a place to start asking questions about people's housing stability. So really the focus of this, this session and the series is, is how do we find people who might be at highest risk of homelessness who may not be knocking on the doors of our, of our of our programs and the services that are out there. And I think we need to think about this like the vaccine. Just because there's a lot of people online for help doesn't mean that we're reaching the most vulnerable people. And just because we created an online portal and we're offering drop-in assistance doesn't mean that highly vulnerable people will be able to navigate that on their own, despite our best efforts to make those resources as friendly um, and accessible as possible. So this is of course a huge area of opportunity for community action agencies since you have the relationships already and you're already working in highly vulnerable communities. So we are gonna hear uh, from some folks um, who are working to create this at the local level. We are going to hear from Cindy Musabu uh, from Housing Families First in Richmond, Virginia. She is the program director and she is working to further develop housing counseling and access as a proven pathway to ending homelessness. She is a um, ongoing resource for us at the Alliance with regard to homeless families. We are also going to be, and I'll get my crib notes on this, Andrea Marcrianus, I think I got it, uh, supervises the assessment and resource team within the Family Services Division of Chesterfield Colonial Heights Department of Social Services in Virginia. Her team assesses immediate and long-term needs of individuals and families who present at social services with an emergency, typically relating to past due rent, mortgage, utility arrears, having food or medication needs and experiencing homelessness or being at risk of becoming homeless. Cecily Dove, another longtime friend of the Alliance is the Chief Program Officer of Crisis Services for Crossroads, Rhode Island. She provides strategic direction and leadership in the oversight, administration and management of all Crossroads crisis and shelter services, which includes the statewide coordinated entry, five emergency shelter programs and housing navigation services. We'll also be hearing from her colleague, Teresa McDivitt, who is the director of the front desk and coordinated entry diversion at Crossroads Rhode Island. Teresa oversees their front door to their homeless services system, including front desk day services, as well as implementing Rhode Island's coordinated entry statewide diversion program and assessment practices to ensure that the households experiencing homelessness are prioritized for the limited shelter and housing resources. So all of these fine ladies are gonna talk about how they're working um, upstream to get those folks who might fall between the gaps of shelter services and more traditional homelessness eviction prevention services, those other families. And so with that, there's a lot to learn from them. I will turn it over to Cindy. Cindy? Thank you, Sharon, and hello, everyone. I am Cindy Wasabu, and I am uh, the program director with Housing Families First. As Sharon mentioned, we're located in Central Virginia, and I just want to pause and just say thank you to everyone who's here. Um, I uh, really appreciate the work that you do, and I'm just my hope for my quick time with you is to just be able to bring some of that oh, out of the box, um, you know, excitement to what you do. I know. Uh, CAP does a lot of work in, in a lot of ways. And so I, I just hope I can support whatever it is you're up to. And really what I wanna talk about from Housing Families First, we, 
we have an emergency shelter for families and that's been my roots with this organization. I used to work at direct services, basically a lot of my career. Um, and in working with families that were coming into the emergency shelter, starting to identify the critical time intervention for that family was just a few months ago and realizing that the toolkit we were offering families to end their homelessness in our shelter program or in our rapid rehousing program were the same essentially for those other families. It just needed to happen at a different time from a different perspective of where they were in their journey. Um, I think many families we saw um, needed just housing counseling and how to unpack their narrative, dig into a little bit of their um, history of homelessness or just what their circumstances were that was prohibiting them from moving forward into the housing that they were already struggling to find. Um, and so what happened in Richmond was we realized our focus in housing and homelessness services really was specific to those literal homelessness, um, families experiencing literal homelessness and that there was a housing hole. Um, slide please, thank you, Laura. Um, and so this housing hole was that folks essentially to us, we knew they were experiencing homelessness but they weren't not necessarily homeless enough for the services we traditionally offered as Sharon was mentioning. And so, um, you know, she talked about maybe the WIC and prenatal care. We went into the school perspective because we often had to work with liaisons in the McKinney Vento program in our region to get families set up to go back to school, transportation, school supplies, um, IEP conversations and all of that. And realizing that housing was such a part of that, but not necessarily making that the conversation to kick us off. And those relationships already existed. So one of the things we started to do is just start talking about it. Um, we just really came together and thought, what if we looked at housing stabilization and housing counseling and financial assistance as part of the subset of services that are offered from a McKinney-Vento liaison office? And so Richmond Public Schools really had this vision for their McKinney-Vento services um, for children experiencing homelessness under the definition of the Department of Education, started to look at how can we bring services to a lot of our families that are experiencing different levels of need, but put housing on the table as a conversation piece. And really, how can we just make that normal? How do we normalize talking about like, where are you staying? How's it going? Do you wish you lived somewhere else? What are those survey questions looking like? How do we bring that up in a way that doesn't make families run for the hillside because they're not wanting to talk about it? Um, and so the Center for Families in Transition and Housing Families First uh, got a $500,000 grant from uh, Robbins Foundation in Richmond, and we were able to kickstart our program. Um, and we focused on these families. You can turn to the next slide. Um, we saw that we were identifying families in the school system that were having housing instability, um, McKinney Vento families that were known to the school system, but also maybe even known to our services on and off over a two or three year period on average. Um, we also started to see the average household size be around three to four people and that there were really two family profiles. One was a family that just really needed funding to move through their housing search and placement. They had done all that work on their own. The autonomy was there, but they really needed that support to sort of land their landlord in the clutch, making sure they had those startup costs to get into the apartment. Um, because that was the financial need that, of course, now you see the market in Richmond and around the United States, you have to have all of this cash up front just to secure your new lease. So that was the issue for those cases. And the other cases we saw needed that additional housing case management and support, um, really unpacking the barriers for their evictions or even things that they didn't know were on their credit that were following them while they were hemorrhaging money in hotel stays. And then also having to hemorrhage money in application fees and you know the leasing costs that they know that they were going to need to have paying down utility debt that had to be taken care of in order to initiate the new um, housing opportunity. So we know those are the those are the elements that are needed to help land housing. And so we were just really trying to figure out how can we um, have input and output with these two types of family profiles and make a system work where we were identifying families very quickly letting them go either way, and then being able to support them either with financial assistance or even with that in-depth housing navigation and counseling. Um, you can go to the next slide. And what we found was that we were able to uh, launch this in the pandemic, which became uh, the X factor for all of this in the sense that we um, wanted to help the school system identify attendance um, improvement in 
um, recidivism and making sure kids that we could identify could go to the next grade level and all of that. And so we're still looking at those things, but from the most part, we were able to at least say, let's make sure families can attend school virtually from their home, not maybe from a hotel stay or from couch to couch to couch. So we really worked hard to identify housing opportunities and we served 221 um, students and their family members um, and about 65% moved into permanent housing in that time frame. And even though we started with a $500,000 grant as a foundation uh, Kickstarter, we matched that with 475,000 additional funds that came through CARES Act and emergency rental assistance and other um, private funding to sort of bolster our scope. And then we moved from Richmond Public Schools and we had some Henrico County Schools and then Chesterfield came on the map. And Andrea is my counterpart on this panel. She's going to talk about how Chesterfield came into that viewpoint. But um, what started as a conversation around a coffee, a coffee gathering to talk about how we can reach these families and find them with Richmond Public Schools now is six referring partners that covers the scope of like a central Virginia. Um, and so we are not a one stop shop for identifying those families, but as an as a organization housing families first, but as a partnership we are because we're all queued up to know what to ask and look for. And we've got a referral process that helps us keep up with how families move up and down the spectrum of homelessness instead of expecting families to know where they're at in their homelessness and to then find the appropriate service. We know to go to those families and we're going through the school systems to do it. Um, but with Chesterfield, what was great is um, we were able to then look at other sectors such as Department of Social Services, such as communities and schools, Chesterfield, such as our housing resource line which helps our whole region um, for housing resources. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll be able to see our referrals that I'm speaking about. And I think what I wanna point out to this group now is just this idea that it doesn't have to be the same with every time you try to like have that conversation, what was working with Richmond wasn't what was gonna work with Chesterfield. And what was working with Chesterfield is not what we do with them right go. Um, so being able to sort of know what your elements are and dump out all your elements on the table and then talk to that locality and say, we know it takes these elements. What does it mean for you to take on some of these or who needs to hold some of these pieces so that combined we can then have the package that we know is necessary to flag, follow and, and house families that would not otherwise hit our, our literal homelessness but are at the greatest risk of falling right into that. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Andrea, who will talk a little bit about the Chesterfield perspective. Actually, can I uh, interject this to Sharon just for a minute? Yes, please do. So, <laughs> so the gap here is, is the school liaisons, uh, homeless school liaisons really are working with a much larger pool of families than homeless yes. providers typically do. Homeless providers are typically those who lack any shelter altogether. Yes. Um, and the school liaisons are working with families who are in hotels or doubled up, some of them who will quickly enter shelter. Could you, just before we turn to Andrew, just to kind of clarify, how do school liaisons identify families who are living in hotels or do you know, or doubled yes. up? What are, the, what are the clues to actually unearth them? Uh, and then they send those families to you, but what, what are some of the things they're on the lookout for? They're on the look, thank you, Sharon. Um, so to answer your question, they're on the lookout for a little bit on the attendance side. How often are our families missing school? Um, you know, how often do they call needing transportation support? Um, how often are they popping in if they do have, some schools do have a, an ability for families to come in and sort of get school supplies or other little things they need. So are they then asking about, um, you know, where are they, where are families staying? I think they're also getting identified through um, even school counselors, school nurses, just other school human services minded staff that might say, you know, I had a conversation and, and within the realm of their release of information, of course, but the school system knows in some cases has the ability to um, look at sort of the academic pieces that might trigger a conversation about hey, the change in grades or what's this looking like? And I think um, with their data, I do know that they're able to look at attendance records. They're able to see, um, you know, we were able to at least jump from families they already had identified as McKinney Vento. So to start with who you know, really, it's like, what families do you already know? And realizing that we are working with the same families. Um, and so 
a little bit of that. Um, and I think, of course, now the pandemic, I think the families that needed some meal assistance, that needed food deliveries, that um, were calling for um, resources for rent that was due, but then had a family doubled up with them. So it was families that were living together and then figuring out, well, how many of you, um, you know, how much, you know, how big is your home and what can we do to help support the, the capacity of that home? Um, because, you know, landlords couldn't evict for non-payment of rent, but you can still be evicted for um, over capacity use or, or having guests stay too long. And so it's those pieces that could also bubble up and need a conversation around um, housing. And I think the McKinney Vento liaisons are the first stop for that because it's usually folks are thinking homelessness, but they don't know for sure. And sometimes families don't believe they're homeless because they're staying somewhere. Um, but they may, if asked, are you staying somewhere that's temporary? Are you staying somewhere that's permanent? And what's your thought on that? Are you going to be potentially having to move again? And do you think you're gonna to have to move again in 60 days? And really starting to help families sort of identify, gosh, I am moving around a lot in a two or three month period. That's the folks that we know next step for them once the resources shift is homelessness um, literally in a shelter or a hotel that someone else has to pay for. Um, and then I also think that they're looking at hotels that are paid for by themselves and how long is that sustainable and how often are they calling for resources to sort of get more bang for their buck after they've paid a week up and then they have to pay again, but they're not sure where they're going to pay the next month or the next week. So I think it's um, still coming through the lens of the school system, but really looking at like the students themselves and taking each, each case independ independently. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I, I can say it's it's kind of interesting the the way that Cindy just finished that um, because my team a lot of times we are the folks who are getting those um, community members who are calling in with those concerns. They are staying in hotels. They are having a hard time making ends meet to pay the next week, or you know if something happens. Uh, they're, they're looking for additional resources in terms of that past due rent or assistance with a hotel payment or the person that they're doubled up with is, especially during COVID, this was a huge issue where, you know, there were safety concerns and folks are getting concerned about having extra folks in the house. And we, we did see some increases in looking for additional housing because where they had been staying was not gonna be an appropriate place anymore um, in that other family's mind. So. Um, yeah, and I think really this was why this is such a fantastic collaboration and we have been so thankful to have had this opportunity because really the combination of service providers and systems has provided a much more rich opportunity for our customers we're trying to serve because they are reaching out, they're putting feelers out to all of us and the more that we can collaborate and figure out how we can make that a more seamless process for folks, the better off everyone's gonna be. Um, and you know, so I can talk a little bit about what that experience looked like in Chesterfield. Uh, really how, you know, I think this would be true of any organization, you know, social services, schools, you know, coordinated care systems, wherever you wanna look at an organization, each really kind of knows those trends that they're seeing, they know some of the programs that are out there and they know some of the folks who are really, they're not included, they're falling through the cracks. And so from a social services perspective, I can tell you my team has been talking for years about folks who have gotten past the point, they, they're not past due rent, they don't have a lease, they are staying in a hotel that makes them that much more vulnerable and really wanting to figure out some ways to provide more case management, provide more financial resources um, to try to get people more stably housed, um, knowing that that's a, a huge issue. And so this has been a conversation we've had within our agency. We've been having, you know, within our continuum of care system, we've been having that discussion with other departments within the county. So our community enhancement department that has some, some dollars flowing through, we're having those discussions so that folks are aware of 
the issues so that if opportunities present themselves in terms of funding, the right people already know and you can jump into action to try to execute uh, uh, any sort of opportunity that comes up. And, and that's really what happened in this situation. Um, you know, we had already been having this discussion. We learned what Housing Families First was doing. And when there was some COVID money that Chesterfield County decided to apply for so that it could be administered um, differently than just going to the state pot of money. Um, they started looking into different opportunities outside of, on a smaller scale, but outside of the kind of more traditional rental emergency relief programs and learned of what Housing Families First was doing with this Bringing Families Home program in Richmond City that had already been up and going, as Cindy mentioned. So at that point, we were able to get several different department, departments, different organizations to the table to start having that conversation about what it could look like. So, you know, looking at some of the folks within Continuum of Care, certainly Housing Families First spearheading because they're actually executing that program, social services coming to the table, um, Chesterfield County Public Schools, really looking at not only the McKinney Bento office, but also, you know, the social work um, system there because they are working in conjunction with McKinney Vento and really have that kind of boots on the ground knowledge at that particular school. Uh, communities and schools, the nonprofit that is in several schools in Chesterfield. Um, and then the housing resource line that Cindy mentioned that's kind of providing that regional assistance for housing. So we really tried to have a conversation about what this can look like and how it could provide an opportunity for there not really to be a wrong way to be involved. So we had more opportunities to identify folks who may have that need and may have that situation um, between all four of us. And then we were able to figure out kind of more of a seamless process to complete that referral process and get folks to Housing Families First to move forward with the program that we've been operating. So you know, it's it's been an operation for a few months in Chesterfield, and we've already had some great successes. Um, I can tell you there's one specific example that we just had recently where uh, this was actually someone who had had an open CPS case. It was on, it was kind of at the last point in time, the last piece of the puzzle that was needed to reunite this mother with her children was safe, stable housing. And we were able to go through and make that determination that this really could be a great fit for this particular person. Talked with Housing Families First, made the referral. That person actually just got housed this month and her children were just reunited with her. So not only have we taken one McKinney Vento case from Chesterfield County Public Schools and allowed that family to be more stable, we now have this wonderful result from a CPS perspective of being able to see a successful reunification and we're getting to work successfully with Housing Families First. So it, it's really been this fantastic collaboration. Um, and yeah, just excited to, to be here and get to share and talk more about it. So. Sharon, I think that's, we can kind of kick it back to you. Muted again, I'm sorry about that. Thank you very Thank you much, very Andrea. Much. And I'm gonna so, turn it over to my friend, Cicely. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you ladies for that amazing overview. Um, my name is Cicely Dove, and as Sharon said, I'm the CPO of uh, Crossroads Rhode Island, really focusing on our crisis and emergency services. Um, you can go right to the next slide, Laura. So Crossroads is the state's, um, Rhode Island's largest um, services provider for individuals and families experiencing homelessness. Our mission is to help homeless or at-risk individuals achieve stable housing. And really by utilizing a range of services as housing as the kind of foundation, um, we utilize a housing, for, uh, housing first philosophy and approach and uh, provide basic needs, shelter, case management, referrals and education and employment services to uh, the folks who are um, coming through our doors. You can go to the next slide. I have the privilege of 
just doing a little bit of the talking, then I'll punt it over to the true expert, Teresa McDevitt. So I think what's important and what we've learned, not only um, you know, locally within our own continuum, but nationally, that the, one of the most effective ways to reduce homelessness for individuals and families, and we've seen it work actually better for families, is to prevent them from coming, becoming homeless in the first place. And really, that has been um, through effective diversion. And so in 2018, um, there's only one COC in our, in our state, and we uh, are part of the coordinated entry system. We implemented the first year of coordinated entry, and those of you who know what that is and all the challenges, you know, it's still a work in progress, and there's lessons that we're learning every day. But I think with some, deli um, some strategic direction, really investing in best practices, we were able to see some great gains during the first year. You can run through that slide, get all the bullets on there. And so within the first year of the coordinated entry, 309 families were successfully diverted from entering the system, which may, uh, for some communities, be uh, just a, a blip. It was huge for Rhode Island, and 282 individuals, single individuals, were also diverted from being homeless. Only 98 of those families required financial assistance to get stably housed, which is incredible, which really highlights the, the effective practice of the problem, perfecting the problem solving conversation, I call. And so within that first year, our homelessness for families was reduced by 8% from the previous year. The shelter wait list, which sometimes folks call the wait list to nowhere, was reduced by 90%. And really, honestly, that was largely due to Crossroads being a recipient of the day one Bezos funds. And it's pretty amazing what you can do with a large amount of money that has zero restrictions and zero um, funding regulations. And so we as an organization, as the largest in the state, decided to invest our own funds into the system really to better serve families in the state. And so um, we invested in shoring up the staff, um, providing uh, uh, a housing navigation services, uh, training our staff, and it clearly paid off. In addition, at the same time, we partnered um, with the local housing authority um, and kicked off a, a campaign called uh, uh, 38 in 100, so where we house 38 families in 100 days, and we provided the supportive services through utilizing the, the Bezos funds. And one of the, the, one of the other additional um, best practice strategies that we have been utilizing for several years that was pairing our housing-based case management supports with uh, education and employment support so that they're working in tandem with folks in the community because we know from the folks who can that earned income is a way to lead to greater housing stability. And so as we continued and in, 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 you know, invested in the system, we were approached by the local uh, school department to say, hey, we have some extra McKinney Vento funds, let's partner. And so now I'll kick it over to Teresa McDevitt who will then take us further. Her camera is still unlocked or sorry. Okay, we're just gonna pivot. Her computer decided to update, so she has to relocate. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, everybody. If we've learned nothing else over the past year and a half, it is how to shift and move in a different direction as quickly as possible. So <laughs> I appreciate your patience uh, with my computer issues. So um, as Cicely said, we you know started with our coordinated entry um, system. And one of the things we wanted to do was to not necessarily wait until people had to be in crisis 
uh, before we could assist them. So we did start uh, to work together with the Provident Public School District. Um, as you can see here, the importance of identification, as Cindy was saying before, um, you know, school is the one place that kids have to go to every day. Um, they, uh, attendance wise, they have to be a part of the school system. And, you know, the school systems for a lot of them are their only supports, whether it's breakfast um, or school supplies. So one of the things we wanted to do was to educate the folks at the Providence, Providence Public School District. So we've done a number of uh, personal educational days for the staff, whether it is for the teachers, the administrators, the support staff. Um, we've had many, many um, sessions with them on how to identify uh, students who are um, in some form of housing instability or literally homeless. Um, so you can see here just quickly, this is statewide numbers. The numbers are going up. Um, 1,000, we were up by 1,500 to by, for the state numbers. And then certainly for 2016, 2017, and then the following year, we were up by about 30 students, um, just specifically in Providence. So we knew that this was an issue. We knew that we wanted to get in the door before families showed up um, on our doorstep. We wanted to get in and help. So what better way than to, uh, utilize the resources within the schools. We can go to the next slide, please. So I wanna just talk a little bit of what, what we have been doing with them. The Providence Public School District has a family and engagement crisis. I think I have the name right, hold on. Never find it when I need it. It's not here. So they have their face team um, and it's a family and engagement ed ed education uh, group that works with any of the families that are uh, being reported as unstably housed or there are some concerns with them. So what we do is have that face team refer out to us any of the families that are reporting to be literally homeless or uh, unstably housed. What we have created is a position, it's a housing stabilization case manager position, and that person um, will work directly with the families within this particular project um, in order to provide short-term solution-focused crisis intervention. Um, we utilize the schools for one thing because the, the, the families are comfortable with the schools. And so there's a bit of a warm handoff. Um, they're having those initial conversations with the counselors that they see on a daily basis within their school systems. And then the, the counselors are asking them about their living situations and then referring them to our case manager. Um, not all of the households are eligible necessarily. We are finding a lot of folks who are doubled up um, so as Cicely talked earlier about, you know, having that private funding, we can do a lot to help folks with that private funding. Um, most of the case managers will work to identify strengths and personal resources uh, and to develop some sort of an intervention to make sure that the participants can obtain and, and maintain stable housing as quickly as possible. So just to go over one, one more time, um, Case managers providing short-term housing-focused case management. That is what that is specifically what we do. Um, is the housing-based and the housing-focused case management. So referrals to education and employment programs, conflict mediation, connection to the greater access for mainstream services, limited financial assistance. We can um, assist with a first month's rent or a security deposit should someone. Uh, have income that can sustain an apartment. Um, we do a little bit of housing search, but most of the time we are um, providing the resources to the clients so that they can go ahead on their own. Um, we like to, and they actually have been quite successful 
Um, we just started this program in March. That was when we received our first referral. We've worked with about 35 families so far and eight of them have stably housed themselves, which is fantastic. Um, just a little bit to go into a little bit more detail. Um, green on, uh, you know, just what are we doing with the family? So that housing stabilization support, we've paid for car repairs. Um, we do some DCYF mediation. We will talk with them and let them know what we can provide. Obtaining health insurance, housing navigation, landlord tenant mediation. If there's nothing we've gotten better at during this past year and a half, it's certainly talking to landlords. Um, legal services, have some great connections at legal services for any families that are having issues with, um, you know, illegal evictions, uh, moving costs, storage costs, we can help with utility costs, um, getting folks hooked up with cash assistance, SNAP assistance. Honestly, we will do whatever it is um, that they report as needing. These are just sort of the biggest ones that, or these are the greatest needs that we've seen so far. You can go ahead to the next slide, please. Is it? Okay. I think I would just add, I'm gonna pivot. Um, so I think, oh, um, I think <laughs> um, thinking kind of forward thinking, what's next? How do we continue to build on the partnership that we've established? Where else do we need to be making connections strategically to outreach to these hidden families? Because we know that there is a significant population of families experiencing homelessness and housing instability that we're not getting for a variety of reasons. And so really, how do we connect strategically into the feeder systems to say, how can we serve these families better? How can we get a little bit ahead of the stream so that we can really prevent the inflow from folks coming in the homeless system? Um, because as we've seen over this last year, and I don't think there's gonna be much slowing down, um, over the next several months is that we are in a bit of a standstill. We're not being able to keep up with the folks coming in. Folks are not moving out as quickly because we can't find, we have the money, but we can't find the units. We can't continue to maintain relationships with the landlords. And so where are there opportunities to be more strategic, more creative and more innovative to really support these vulnerable families? Some questions. So Cecily, I have a question before we open it um, up to, and so I'll invite people to ask questions in the chat, but I actually have questions for the panel first. Um, and so, so the first question, just for folks who may be a little less in the HUD speak world, the coordinated injury, it's essentially there's two areas where you're really um, tackling homelessness, you know, as in people who may enter shelter, defining it that way. There's two groups of people that are often overlooked that would often get missed. And that is those who are already on a wait list for shelter. That's what you did. You had 400 families sitting on a wait list saying, I need shelter. And, and then you went and offered them something and they were able to not come into shelter. Yes. So I might, I might want to know a little bit more specific about yeah. what that looked like, what that intervention actually looked like. But yeah. then, so, so that's, but that's one pile. And then the next set of families who are often overlooked are not yet known to us in the homeless services world, but they're known to school systems and school liaisons. And so you're building a bridge there with the school liaisons and with others to, to assist them. And both sets of families, those on a wait list for shelter and those who are known to schools, but not to us, are families that kind of traditional eviction prevention programs may be missing that yes. we could be thinking about strategically. But if you don't mind, Cecily, could you tell us a little bit more about, there's 400 families on a wait list for shelter. What did you do? What did that actually look like? Yeah, and, and so really, it was really Teresa's amazing team that called every single one of those families. And, and the, one of the reasons why there was such a swell of those families is because even despite the process of coordinated entry, people thought that I needed to be on this list in order to get any housing support. And so there was miscommunication, misinformation. And so when we um, had conversations, said, listen, the reality of it is, is that there's not enough capacity. So you've got what you need 
to be stably housed. Let's take a little bit what you have. Let's take a whole lot of what we have to get you housed and never to return. And we were highly successful, really through a strength, strength-based um, conversation, adding, you know, coupling with the reality of the capacity within our system and financial resources, right? And I think that was very, very successful. And people didn't want to go into shelter. Again, they thought they needed to be on this list in order to get help, right? So there was an opportunity that we missed because we could have did better with marketing. I would say on the second piece of the, the liaison and connecting with the school. So we, as Teresa mentioned, we have for years been providing um, education support and really um, awareness of the, the implications of homeless children in the classroom, right? So uh, with the teachers, which I personally think is the, uh, a population that we're not targeting, they are spending more time um, with the students than the liaisons, than the, than the, uh, the guidance counselors, because it's the daily occurrences of school, of the kids in school. So the tardiness, kind of what they're wearing, their physical presentation that teachers were ignorant of to not say this could be indicative of something, right? And so having us come in there and consistently help them identify potential um, indicators of, of housing instability was critical. I still think that there's a way to go. Um, I still think that there is a disconnect of what homeless children look like, sound like, act like, and not every behavior, a child experiencing behavior is someone who's experiencing a housing instability or vice versa. So, but it's really intentional connections with the schools. Um, and so not just the homeless school liaison, they can't do it by themselves. It's the school liaison, it's the guidance counselor, it's the principals, right? It's the school administration to say, hey, we're a support in the system. How can we serve your children? Because again, how do you expect a child to focus, to, to learn, to, uh, to achieve their educational milestones when they don't know where they're sleeping from night to night, right? And so it sounds very simplistic and sophomoric, but year, I've been in this organization 20 years. Years later, we're still struggling with the same thing. Okay, and I have a, a, a quick question for you, Cicely, and then for all the panelists. Um, and uh, I invite folks to uh, submit their questions, but I have a pile here. Uh, the quick question for you is, um, so coordinated entry for folks who are not, you know, immersed in the homeless of this world is largely used coordinated in, in, uh, coordinated entry and assessment tools for who gets what, you know, how do you disseminate, how do you rank, how do you prioritize if you only can provide permanent supportive housing for 5% of the families or 5% of the people, how does that get decided if rapid rehousing, if there's not enough of that to go around, how do you, how do you determine that? So that's the role of assessment tools. So the question that's been submitted First for you, and then um, is what assessment process are you using to, to kind of prioritize people for housing interventions? And then the follow-up question for everybody is, what is the environment in which you guys are delivering services? Is it urban, rural, suburban? Um, that's probably the easiest one. But Cecily, do you wanna do the assessment tool question first? And you're on I'll, mute. I'll do it and then punt it to Teresa. This is really in her wheelhouse, okay. her baby. Um, but up until December, we were using the VIS for dad, and then we had a COC evaluation happen, and it's in limbo. I'm gonna say <laughs> it's in limbo. <laughs> yeah, we've had a little bit of a reorganization with our coordinated entry system. So Crossroads originally uh took part in the call center and the assessment process as well as shelter referrals. And we had a partner in that with us, which would take care of the housing referrals. Um, we were spinning our wheels a lot because there was no shelter space, shelters were full. Um, so we decided to look at things and say, let's focus on diversion. Um, so we're going to just take a list of families and individuals who are waiting for shelter and we're going to do that deeper dive in with them and that's going to be our contribution. So right now, um, the Coalition to End Homelessness in Rhode Island is working on creating their own 
um, assessment tool. Um, I think we were all in agreement that the VI SPDAT was used immediately because it was it was there and it was it was you know as efficient as it could, but we thought we could do better. Um, so we up until December it was the VI SPDAT, and since then we've been sort of using our own tool, which is definitely a work in progress. And I would just add one more thing quickly. I think I, I also want the, the attendees to know that the diversion conversation just doesn't have to stop at the front door. And so we've been highly successful at doing secondary diversion or rapid resolution. So even with folks who end up are on the wait list, but even once they're in shelter, right? Because we know the process could be a bit more challenging. And so that diversion conversation continues. And again, we've been successful at rapidly exiting folks with a very minimal amount of financial assistance and support in order to achieve housing stability. And we're and you are working statewide, so urban, rural, and suburban. Absolutely. Okay. With a 2% vacancy rate. <laughs> um, I would just add kind of very similar to them. We had a pause on VI SPDAT, but we had been using that for prioritization. We also look at um, uh, medical vulnerabilities, length of length of nights um, unhoused or unsheltered um, or just length of stay in a, in a particular um, shelter environment. So we kind of look at all that. I can say for accessing shelter and accessing uh, the rapid rehousing pieces that you're either, um, you have to be within three days or less of becoming literally homeless to access a family shelter, um, but you have to be literally homeless to access a rapid rehousing program. And so we work as a, as a system to sort of identify um, you know, open slots for families and try to move through. Um, I think what I love just tying it into why this partnership is great is that, again, our whole team that once was kind of in the lane of just identifying families that needed shelter or just identifying families that needed to be rapidly rehoused now are well versed in sort of the other ends of that movement for families that doesn't fall into that. So we might get a phone call or hear about on the hotline or get a a conversation, an email from a partner that's like, hey, this family is kind of in limbo and we're not sure, we are able to say, yep, okay, their first responder for this crisis is going to be this person on this team who's still in the same team as our shelter and our rapid housing. So we're, we've equipped our teams to sort of know how to help uh, liaison or, you know, um, be an ambassador for what the family situation is and to know if it changes because real time upsets the balance in, in that sense. So a family that maybe started out as self-paying a hotel hit our bringing families home team, but then as their situation deteriorated very rapidly and now they're paid for by a charitable organization or social services. And so that work, that work and that relationship can then go into another worker's lane, except we're on the same team. So the progress isn't lost. They're not having to start and stop and restart and stop. There's continuity of care. So that the goal of having a housing conversation and landing into housing still can take place in 30 or 45 nights. And yes, the pandemic has slowed down that trajectory, but not in a way that makes it impossible. Um, so I think that that's the other piece. And we, we serve in or, uh, a wide range of um, like city and county, surrounding counties. So some urban, suburban, and then even, you know, Powhatan, which like those areas can be really rural. We have house families from our rapid rehousing program in those places as well. And I think just to kind of throw in my own two cents, I think my vision, my goal, my hope for family home on the family homelessness service system is that we, we don't get have to get to a place where we start to triage because really assessment tools is a, a triage tool who co yeah. who goes first. Um, and, you know, and I think that some communities, including Richmond and including Crossroads are moving towards a model where they're trying to for everyone who seeks shelter, they're trying to do diversion. Is there something else that we can be doing? Can we assist you from where you're at so that you don't come into shelter, but we can help, we're we'll still help you, but you don't have to come into shelter. And then they have enough shelter shelter for everyone that can't be safely diverted. And then everybody gets some kind of help navigating to get back into housing. But when for those who it's not successful, you just intensify the intervention. So permanent supportive housing becomes available or rental assistance, uh, permanent 
rent subsidies become available, not because you've got a score of an eight or a nine or a seven or a six, but because, you know, well, we tried rapid rehousing and it looks like you're going to need a bit more and we have more vouchers and we have more resources. And so that's why if, if you all don't mind, I'll do a little plug for you should be in, involved in the Alliance's advocacy network because we're trying to get the resources to make this an actuality. I mean, the assessment tools is, are not magic and nothing you guys will develop will be magic. It's just who gets to be at the front of the line for something that there's not enough of and a, a better approaches like how do we get more of what we need to help everybody. Um, so, so we don't have that much more time. I, uh, I want people to do two things, um, to uh, put in the chat box what they would like to hear more about. I am going to schedule the next webinar. It's gonna be focusing on this problem solving and diversion uh, that you heard so much about that people are having successful success with. So we're gonna have somebody from the Alliance who's a trainer on that participate and, um, and examples of communities, including uh, a, a CAP agency, hopefully if they agree, uh, that's doing diversion for their entire homeless service system. So I wanna keep the conversation going on diversion, um, but let's finish this conversation up too. So a lot of the folks who may be listening in today, um, are trying to do homelessness prevention. They're trying to do eviction prevention, but they may not be coordinating on an active basis with the, the homeless service system. You know, they may be working kind of in parallel efforts, you know, not necessarily communicating. So I think hopefully they've seen from you uh, some of the benefits of, of greater coordination, but could you speak a little bit more about, um, about building bridges with the homeless service system, what's in it for them, you know, and what can they, what can they get from you? What kind of data and expertise do you have that might help them achieve their own goals? Um, and who would like to start? Maybe Andrea, because you're the one from outside the homeless service system. Well, officially you're in the yeah, social yeah. services. So why don't I start with you? Yeah, you know, we, we kind of sit in a unique place where and, and my team especially, where if someone reaches out to the agency, we're kind of a catch-all. So, you know, what you had mentioned in the introduction in terms of looking at folks who are past due on their rent or mortgage, utility payments, um, you know, food insecurity, medication needs, folks experiencing homelessness or at risk of becoming homeless. All of those folks are, are really coming to our team and we're trying to have those discussions. So we're seeing a lot of people in limbo. Um, certainly it with the COVID funding that has become available, it has been extremely helpful for renters who are behind and you know meet those specific requirements. That's been a great resource to be able to have a, have a referral system and mechanism there. But for those other individuals who are past that point, uh, we really have been focusing on, we're, we're trying to support one another within the coordinated entry system and really trying to make it less of a frustrating process for the individuals trying to access that program. So, you know, we know that resources are limited. We know that shelter space is limited and that the system is saturated. And we're really trying to have those real conversations with people who are presenting at social services to say, this is what it looks like let's have some conversation and figure out what can we do together to what natural supports do you have? Let's talk about the different things that are going on in your life that maybe we can work with you to try to support and see that you can have a stable, safe place. You know, so we really are trying to do some of those pieces in terms of helping mediate with family members. And, you know, certainly we are coordinated and we will reach out or refer people to our coordinated entry system if, if that's appropriate. Um, you know, but we really are trying to figure out some other means within our agency. Um, and then having those connection points to other organizations where, you know, if we have that professional relationship, we can reach out and have some of those conversations to make it less stressful for the family or the individual that is engaging with us. Anybody else want to weigh in? 
And I would just think that I think to 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 go off something you said, Sharon, is about being able to articulate and clearly delineate what is in it for each agency. I think being able to maximize on our collective strengths and resources and not duplicate efforts. And so if you can handle this, you know, we as this organization can handle this in order to stabilize the family, right? And and think about who else needs to be uh, owning a part of this. I think one of the things that we know historically is that um, there uh, is a lack of shared responsibility within the community-based providers. And so, hello. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, within the community-based providers. So if we look at it, I this sounds really corny, but like a village mentality where we all own these folks, right? And it's going to take multiple hands, not at the same level, but really to wrap around, um, I think we'd see much better outcomes and not trying to um, either duplicate efforts or outdo one another for the sake of outcomes, right? And I just wanted to add to that too, um, nothing beats having that quick reach person to say like, hey, I have this question and I hate to boil it down to that, but we didn't, I never really engaged with Andrea. I didn't even, you know, we didn't, our DSS on that side, you know, we really see a lot from Henrico because we're located close to Henrico, but I just think it's, it is that it's leaning into the network. It's leaning into, hey, I have a question. This is the general piece. The money piece is the other thing that I think is just cannot be understated. You know, we are always looking for creative ways to, you know, I think it was Teresa who mentioned storage units and, you know, helping car repair, helping with this. And in a lot of ways, every community is wrestling those things to the ground. But when it comes to saying like, you know what, this grant only covers debt from this period to this period, but this family has debt beyond that. Now, what do we do? Everyone just know that's a problem, right? And like put it on everyone's radar. And then eventually, you know, a solution in our case really came through for several families on that specific issue just because we sent the flares up. And I think what's super important is um, we're really hyper connected, but are we efficiently connected? And so, how can we make that um, work for us in the ways that we are coming together? There's community meetings, there's weekly meetings, there's case conferencing, there's all of it is happening. So then how do we make it happen where um, it fits what the present need is? And I think that's the part that takes the tweaking. Um, but if the relationships are there, then nurture the relationships and put your put your flares up and then sit in it and see what happens, but don't let it go, um, keep after it. And I think that's the thing about it is it's not rocket science in some cases, it is simple. Like I think there was a, a comment in the chat about something with data sharing and we talked about this because it is it is a headache to get legal on this side and legal on that side or how do we make sure it's okay but then getting down to the, the point of are they housed are they in progress do they have apps pending um you know are they discharged are they incoming you know even just the status of that brings relief to direct service providers it brings relief to um, families to sort of know i'm in process i'm in the referral stage you know and i and, and then when there's problems like you know, the social problems that come up with, how are we doing with the, the at-risk issues with the youth in this family? Or what are we dealing with the infants under five, you know, the kids under five and how are we supporting them? We're getting the whole family in this too. We're not just getting school-age kids, we're getting everybody. So I think it's really like working that way and thinking that way about it. So, I mean, if, I'll just point to uh, I think if one thing positive comes out of this whole awful year or so we've been involved, it would love, it would be wonderful to see a, most, a more closely knit connections between homeless service family providers and those who are regularly interacting with vulnerable families. I think there's this just um, big silos between housing responses and social service responses. And there is definitely a lot of overlap. A lot of child welfare involved families have a lot of Po you know, poverty, of course, but also, you know, housing that makes it more likely that a child will be removed from the home and less likely that they'll be reuni reunited in a kind of an expedited way. Um, the homeless service system also has really good 
insight and information about trajectories from where families are coming. We know where they're getting referred from. Sometimes we can tell you the neighborhoods or the blocks that they're coming from, you know, the kinds of the housers, the landlords that they're coming from. And so if you are involved in really doing strategic thinking about homelessness prevention, this is a real good way, you know, building some silos here. And, and another thing is that we've developed um, not ideally, but due to necessity, you know, strategies. So strategies around, well, let's see what else we can get away with, or let's figure this out, even though you have, wow, even though you have a pretty extensive eviction history, we've figured out how to sell landlords into taking risks, or well, we've, we've learned to do some double security deposits and some other kind of landlord incentives. So there's a skill set there's data um, and, and, and there's really some benefit. I mean, I think one of the things that struck me out of last month's webinar that I keep, that I think is very important is that Los Angeles, you know, this book, Janie Roundtree, they looked at, pub, they looked at people on the caseload of the entire Los Angeles County system. So caseload might mean jail, might mean child welfare, might mean substance use, mental health, but they found people and I think it was some, they found a subset of clients, maybe it was mostly single adults, who were 48 times more likely to enter home shelter than the average person on their caseload. And only like, only less than 30 people, you know, who are at the highest risk of homelessness was getting homelessness prevention assistance. So we're, you know, the public social service systems and entities, uh, are meeting highly vulnerable people and the resources are over here and some expertise is over here and we need to knit it all together. Um, and, and hopefully that's all work that we can embark on. So any final thoughts? I'm gonna go around and then we'll close it up. Any words of advice to folks from the community action agency world about things they can do tomorrow to reach people that they might be overlooking today? Um, I'll do it in the order that we did the, and I won't forget Teresa, who's over in the corner. But uh, Cindy, do you want to start? Yeah. So for tomorrow, you know, schedule the call that you've been putting off. You know, call, you know, you've got colleagues and peers. I know there's turnover happening. The great resignation is taken over, but it, call the folks who are still in the game and set up the calls. I think the thing is what I've noticed is like all the ideas are out there, they're percolating. So just scaffold them out and then wait to see when the shakedown will happen on funding or how it will show up with the next grant cycle. Um, I think it, it's not funding then project, it's build your project now, get your people together now, have lunch now, and then be ready for when the opportunity comes in. Because I think that's the part that was what launched us so quickly we were supposed to start in july last year and we had to launch in april but it's because we were doing the toolkit already we just had to get people installed and then the funding came so you know and the funding only came in february so from february to april all of a sudden now here we are a year later and this is the results and so i say to you like don't put it off scaffold now mm -hmm. andrea yeah, I, and I would say just building off of that, kind of the same thing, but um, really coming into, once you've identified a couple of organizations, even if you don't have a connection, just kind of doing a, a reach to see if somebody will be willing to have a conversation. And when you do, just coming to the table with an open mind. And I, I mean, I really think that is how a lot of partnerships and really how some of this happened, quite honestly, at, you know, before this funding stream came, I was just connecting with housing families first to learn more because I had been on a call and heard what they were doing. And I was thinking, wow, we, we really need to talk, you know? Um, and, and once you can come to the table with an open mind, no agenda, just learn more about one another, what you're doing, what your strengths are, when those situations and opportunities come up, then you can start putting the puzzle pieces together and you can do it more quickly because as Cindy said, you've already started those conversations and it, you're to a more organic point of putting things together. This one? 
And I'll go quickly, Teresa actually had to step out, but these ladies pretty much summed it up all. I was just gonna say, you know, build the framework, have it ready so that um, when the opportunity comes, um, you are prepared. Um, I would also say sometimes, I know we've had to divorce the way we've done things previously, right? And be willing to take risk, be innovative, thinking out the box, destroy the box, um, and do something different and reach out. So really these ladies summed it up, but we gotta do things differently if we want different results. And I'll add one piece and then turn it back over to Laura. I think one thing everyone can do is take a look at how is this emergency rental assistance being accessed in your community? What are the requirements to be eligible? What are the hoops that people have to go through? Think about what happened with the vaccine. Think about who didn't get help. Think about the, we all knew the race equity issues with that. And yet, and yet, and yet. So think, think about advocacy, thinking of, think about weighing in with uh, state and local partners about how those resources could become more accessible to the kinds of families we're talking about. Families in motels, families who are doubled up, uh, families that don't have traditional leases, families who aren't knocking on the door uh, or have the capacity to do a 17 page online portal and upload documents. Um, so uh, think about that because your voice would really, really help and they're all eligible, including, you know, the funding can also be used to, for pure rehousing. So families on wait lists of shelters and all of that, this is another way to use that money. So weigh in. So thank you all. Next month, we will um, talk about diversion, get into that practice, what it really looks like. I will review all of these comments. You're welcome to reach out to me anytime, Sharon McDonald, smcdonald at naeh.org. Um, pretty easy to find on the National Alliance and Homelessness website. And I thank these wonderful ladies who I was, who I, I won't say always learned from, but I, you know, cause I just met too, <laughs> but who, you know, two just great, wonderful homeless service systems that I really appreciate. And Laura, I'm turning back to you. Well, thank you so much to all of our speakers and Sharon for um, designing and creating this webinar. Um, as Sharon shared, we will be hosting another webinar on August 11th, the next in this series. Um, you will all receive, probably in about a week or less, an email with the recording for this webinar, the slides, information about our next webinar, and also the previous ones in this series. We'll also include this survey. Um, which my colleague will put into the chat for us. Um, we love getting feedback about what you thought of the webinar, but also what you would like covered next. Um, we'll be hosting an annual convention, another series with Sharon. It's an opportunity for you to say what would be most valuable. And just to tell you about some other upcoming events, uh, I heard property tax, um, as an issue in the chat, um, we'll be hosting a webinar next Wednesday with the AARP Foundation about their free tool in 10 different states to um, help facilitate the process of property tax aid um, for seniors. And I mentioned annual convention coming up in the very beginning of September. Um, if you haven't registered, please do. We're doing a hybrid event this year. So most people will be in person in Boston, but we'll also have a lot of attendees joining us virtually. Um, as many of you are aware, uh, child tax credit is a big you know, issue right now, just making sure every family who's eligible has access. Um, the partnership has some resources and social media, tools, as well as a webinar with those more specific uh, tips. We also have a whole bunch of other resources. Um, this is our COVID-19 resource series on a variety of topics. We have a video to help encourage people in your network to get vaccinated. Um, we have different community action leaders saying why they decided to get vaccinated. Um, we continue to have a lot of resources around whole family approach, serving all, the entire family together. We have an institute website, as well as design briefs that talk about you know, specific ways that organizations have implemented that. 
Um, and as always, we have a very rich library of resources on Community Action Academy, courses you can take, um, past webinars. And at any point, you can contact anyone on the Practice Transformation Team um, as we continue to develop resources for you. Um, so with that, I'll thank our speakers one more time. Thank you for everyone who joined us today. It was such a rich conversation, and we're so glad to have you. Have a, have a great rest of your day.